going to try to make this very short, uh, despite the fact this is a very, very big topic, but I'm going to try to highlight some important information about the use of cannabis during pregnancy. So let's um, just illustrate why this is an important question and concern. This is a 2018 publication in which they basically did a, a secret shopper method survey to find out what dispensaries in Colorado are actually saying to women who might be pregnant. So the method was that a caller um, identifies herself as a woman with pregnancy and experiencing morning sickness. I want to emphasize morning sickness, not hyperemesis gravidarum or um, anything beyond that, just morning sickness. Uh, results were of 400 dispensaries that were contacted, almost 70% recommended cannabis for morning sickness to the secret shopper caller. And I don't know if this is a good or a bad thing, but of the dispensaries that had designated themselves as medical dispensaries, um, over 80% of those dispensaries made the recommendation for cannabis as a treatment for morning sickness. And 65% um, of the advisories uh, were, the, the, the advisors said, basing the recommendation um, just on personal opinion. Uh, this despite the fact that Colorado is one of the few states with legal marijuana that actually lists a number of adverse effects on their website. Uh, uh, on a parallel note, I did a survey of the 34 medical marijuana programs in the US, 24 of them say not one word about risks on their website despite, for example, ex explaining how minors can get cards um, and, and, uh, and other things. But, but to this, uh, the states that have legalized it for recreational purposes on average are doing a better job of disclosing risks on their websites. Uh, so despite a fairly strong advisory from the Colorado government to say this is not recommended for pregnancy, um, the, when the rubber hit the road, the dispensary workers were recommending it um, in the majority of times. And uh, this is probably a good reason why we see that in an era where education about the potentially negative effects of alcohol and cigarettes have really taken hold, and we see these um, exposures in utero going down, uh, cannabis has been on a tear, uh, increasing by 75%. And depending upon the methodology, it's been estimated that anywhere between 4% and 13% of pregnancies um, involve cannabis exposure to the developing, to the developing uh, fetus. So before I go further, I just want to help us get all on the same page um, about some definitions. On the left column are going to be what I'll call the traditional definitions, and on the right column we're going to call the modern ones. Um, so traditionally, cannabis is a botanical name, um, it describes a genus within a, a superfamily of plants, and this genus comprises uh, three species with hundreds of different uh, strains. Marijuana is just a common vernacular use, so um, oak is how we say commonly in English um, the genus of trees is called Quercus, and so marijuana is to cannabis as, er as oak is to Quercus. Uh, they can be largely interchangeable, um, although many people are preferring uh, to use cannabis due to some of the um, historical associations between marijuana and um, racism directed at Latin American people. Uh, regardless, if you go to Google, you'll find that most Americans are, are still talking about marijuana, and if you go surveying state laws, most state laws are calling it marijuana. Um, on, moving on. Uh, since the cannabis um, has a lot of chemicals that it makes that are unique to this genus of plants. And so any chemical that comes from cannabis is called a cannabinoid. And estimates range between 400 to 500 unique chemicals to this genus. Um, and a lot of them can get into the bloodstream um, of the kid. And uh, we only know really about what two of them are doing. Um, of the numerous cannabinoids that these plants make, to the two that are the most important are THC, tetrahydrocannabinol, uh, which is the intoxicating or sens sensory or perception altering substance that most people use marijuana for. Um, and there is CBD or cannabidiol. Despite the fact that the name cannabidiol sounds like cannabis, it's really just one component of it. 
um, and CBD is a specific chemical which is biologically active but doesn't have a lot of subjective um, psychotropic effects. So those are those. Um, if you look at state marijuana laws, then you'll see this really what I see tricky part where it will say, when we say marijuana, we mean, and then they go on to basically describe anything um, that can be traced to a plant at any concentration. Um, and in some state laws, they'll even say any derivative of a chemical that comes from a marijuana plant. Uh, medical marijuana is defined essentially by the intention of the user. So if I want to use THC to treat nausea, that is a medical use of THC. State laws don't specify that medical marijuana has to be a certain composition or a certain strength. Um, I talk to many people who say, who seem to think that medical marijuana means that it's low in intoxicating THC and rich in CBD. Um, that's actually not reflected in, in, almost, in any state law that I've read so far. And if you look at, if you just go and look at what's available online in medical dispensaries in various states, you'll see 70% uh, THC oils or capsules or so forth. So, so really, it's just anything. Um, and because it could be potentially anything, then medical marijuana is not necessarily safer than recreational plant marijuana of say the 1970s or 80s um, it because again it could be anything so those are um it, it makes it a bit bedeviling to try to then make statements about safety when uh, modern medical marijuana could be essentially anything but we'll do the best we can uh given the available data if you want to ask the question, should I be worried about drug X as potentially impacting fetal development, then you know you have to first say, does it get into the bloodstream of the baby? Um, does can it cross the placenta? And if it's in the placenta, then if it's crossed the placenta, can it enter the fetal bloodstream? And if it's in the fetal bloodstream, where does it go? Um, and for both THC and CBD, which are very, very fat soluble and therefore very able to cross cell membranes, we find that yes, they can, that both of these major cannabinoids can in fact cross the placental barrier. They do, based upon primate studies, enter the fetal circulation and they do enter the fetal brain. Um, and both primate studies as well as human studies have shown that THC and CBD can enter breast milk. So um, in, in one uh, 1987 study, the one by Bailey, uh, they documented that uh, the THC can actually be concentrated in breast milk. Um, in this study, regular cannabis users had breast milk concentrations of THC, which were eight times higher than the simultaneously measured blood levels of THC. And um, then, I, not included here, but um, it's been shown that uh, that can affect fetal behavior. So, uh, yeah, so, so because it can get into the placenta, into the bloodstream, into the fetal brain, it is a concern. Uh, once it's in the brain, um, the title of this banner is, what does marijuana do? Again, marijuana is a plant with thousands of chemicals. I'm going to focus on THC and CBD um, and proceed from there. So um, I, think, I think this audience probably is aware that our bodies have receptors for cannabinoids and we, our bodies make these receptors because our bodies make chemicals endogenously that activate those receptors. So the endogenous chemicals that our bodies make that activate these cannabinoid receptors are called endocannabinoids. Um, in the, the major endocannabinoids are known as anandamide and 2-acylglycerol um, or 2-arachidonylglycerol, I'm sorry, it's 2-AG it's called. Um, point is, we make our own, we make our own cannabinoids um, throughout the body. The cannabinoid receptors exist in two major forms, CB1 and CB2. Both are G protein coupled receptors. In the brain, which is what I'm focusing on in this talk, CB1 is far and away the most overwhelmingly um, expressed receptor. Uh, when when either endogenous anandamide activates the CB1 receptor or if it's THC that activates the CB1 receptor, um, the effect is to reduce the release of neurotransmitter. So if the CB1 receptor is located on a glutamate bearing neuron, then THC will inhibit the release of glutamate, 
which is the brain's most widely used neurotransmitter substance. More than a half of the synapses in the brain utilize glutamate, and THC impairs that release. If the CB1 receptor is located on a GABA-producing neuron, then THC will inhibit the release of GABA. Um, whereas glutamate was the number one neurotransmitter in terms of number of synapses using it, GABA is number two, with estimates between 30 and 40% of synapses throughout the brain being GABAergic synapses. So THC um, has a potential to interact with about 80% of the synaptic activity within a brain um, and to alter the output of the number one and number two neurotransmitters in the system. Um, aside from we'll call normal adult neurotransmission, the CB1 receptors are intimately linked to um, brain development at almost all phases of development. Uh, during developments, the endocannabinoid system um, is directing the growth of neuronal axons, um, directing these axons to form bundles or you know, fiber pathways within the brain, and directing the formation of synapses. Uh, so, um, We've established that THC can enter the fetal brain, and once in the fetal brain, it can interact with these systems. Um, further comments or data points to um, impress on you the importance of the endocannabinoid system. Um, every animal that's ever been studied has endocannabinoid or cannabinoid receptors present. Um, CB1 and CB2 receptors are present on human eggs, and CB2 receptors are present on human sperm. Um, so we can see um, once the egg has been fertilized in a chicken, you see CB1 expression occurring 38 hours after conception. Um, and based upon um, mammalian studies and some, um, some handful of human data, we're estimating that the, CB, that the cannabinoid system comes online by three to four weeks of human development following conception. Um, during these extremely early phases, the endocannabinoid system is helping the fertilized um, and developing uh, embryo down the fallopian tubes. It's preparing the uterine wall to receive the embryo um, and to regulate implantation. Once the embryo has been implanted, the cannabinoid system importantly regulates the development of the placenta. Um, and placental disruptions can obviously influence fetal development, um, as well as hinted at in the previous slide, uh, the, the cannabinoid system is, is deeply involved in regulating the growth and formation, the growth of axons and the formation of their connections. So it's a big deal. Um, here's what the, F so again, marijuana, cannabis, whatever you wanna call it, has two major components that are used and can actually be bought in nearly pure form under most state medical marijuana laws, and those are THC and CBD. Um, both of those chemicals actually are already federally legal um, and uh, are available to prescribe, and because, because um, to get that status, they've had clinical studies which generate the usual FDA um, guidelines. So here is uh, directly from the prescribing information from Marinol, which is Delta 9, tetrahydrocannabinol. Um, note, there are um, published studies that suggest that it can increase, these are based upon um, yeah, humans, that may increase the risk of fetal growth restriction, low birth weight, preterm birth, being small for gestational age, admission to the NICU, and stillbirth. Um, so it says there in the prescribing information for THC should be avoided. Um, also from the prescribing information, um, it comments that um, THC in animals decreases maternal weight gain and the number of pups living at uh, the time of delivery also increases fetal mortality and spontaneous abortion um, in, in rats. So that's that. Let's move on to the prescribing information for CBD. Um, and again, verbatim from the PI, um, FDA warns there are no adequate data on developmental risks. However, on the right column, looking at animals, we see evidence of um, fetal mortality, decreasing body weights, uh, decreasing growth, decreasing sexual maturation. Interestingly, long-term behavioral changes and um, long-term effects on the reproductive um, viability of the offspring rats. Here's something that should make that makes me concerned. 
um, at maternal, pla they, these effects happened at maternal plasma exposures, which were similar to that seen in humans. So in, in rats, in, I'm sorry, in rabbits, you get these effects at CBD concentrations, which are pharmacologically relevant in man, although in, rab in rats, it took higher doses. Um, so can, how can we extrapolate from animals to humans? It's very tricky, nobody really knows. Uh, we would like to have some data on humans, but we really don't have that many data on humans. Um, if you want to also stay up at night uh, being worried, you can look at in vitro studies in which CBD is impairing the ability of the placenta to keep out foreign material or to extrude toxins. So um, it certainly has the potential to be very disruptive um, in pregnancy. So there's that. Um, this is, these are some of the references for the statements that the FDA made in the prescribing information, um, as well as the odds ratios. So for low birth weight, and meaning less than five and a half pounds of delivery, um, you're looking at 1.7 fold increase in that risk, um, and essentially a doubling of being small for gestational age. In other words, might not be five and a half pounds, but below the weight where the, the, the fetus ought to be at delivery, and also doubling the, the risk of admission to the intensive care unit following delivery. Um, a, it is what it is. I, I don't mean to offend anybody by including this data, but there was a study in Sweden which uh, looked at, um, which did some uh, neurochemical studies of fetal brains from aborted fetuses. And it was found that if the fetus had had in utero cannabis exposure, that that was affecting the expression of dopamine receptors. Um, and that may be related to another concerning observation in which they looked at children who had been exposed to cannabis in utero and they gave them a, a neuropsychological test which gauged um, logical or psychosis prone thinking and, and they found in fact that in utero exposure uh, was associated with a higher prevalence of um, abnormal thinking habits in, in children. So um, hinting here at long-term long -term behavioral effects from in utero exposure. Um, you, I believe, will get a PDF of this, which this, this reference will be hyperlinked for you. Uh, but there have been a very, there's been a handful of long-term studies in which they follow prospectively cohorts of children who are born to women who use cannabis during pregnancy. And um, this admittedly sparse data pool is showing some concerning findings um, in terms of cognitive impairments, um, increased levels of aggression, anxiety, and hyperactivity. Um, during adolescence, we're seeing higher rates of depression symptoms, um, decreasing abstract reasoning, and higher levels of antisocial behavior and delinquency, as well as for young adults, we're seeing um, lingering or continuing cognitive impairments, as well as increased risk of drug-seeking behavior. So to summarize, um, the endocannabinoid system, every, everybody has one, and it is present from fertilization through adulthood, and it is very active at guiding the growth of brains, taking exogenous cannabinoids um, in the form of THC, whether synthetic or purified or directly from plants, um, certainly sets up the possibility for interacting with this growth regulating system. And the animal studies are abundant to say that it is disruptive for fetal development. Um, top level markers of fetal weight and growth and uh, NICU admissions are speaking to some ability to impair at least some fetuses that are exposed to cannabis during pregnancy. And a, um, the number of extant longitudinal studies are pointing to the potential uh, for longer term um, neurobehavioral effects of in utero exposure. So um, there's good reason for the state of Colorado to advise against the use of cannabis during pregnancy. Um, and I believe that we should, I, I think we in all states that legalize cannabis um, probably should publicize the, the specific and granular details of such risks.